Jacob here. Today we're going to be looking at the RSI Polaris. This ship is honestly quite remarkable as far as how this ship should be used and the amount of damage it does. However, shield strength is something it's perhaps not so remarkable out. I'm personally looking forward to this ship myself, having obtained OC Polaris quite early in my Star Citizen career. There isn't any particular mechanics needed for this ship, other than those already present in the game. With that in mind, the only thing holding this ship back is, well, other ships. There are counters to a ship like this already in game, so I'd personally be comfortable with this in game with how the PU currently stands. Apart from perhaps what's worth taking a shot at with a Polaris. I've researched the Polaris a decent amount, and so what I say here is backed by research. What I don't mention here either means there is no evidence of it, it was discreetly mentioned later after its original concept date, or I simply didn't find this research or didn't feel the need to mention it. As always, see the chapters for whatever you are interested in. I do ramble, so these may not be entirely accurate, with my own added speculation and theories as always. Let's not forget to sub up to keep up with the content. We'll touch a little bit on the manufacturer, as I typically do when overviewing flagships of manufacturers. There would be no Star Citizen, of course, if it wasn't for RSI. In two ways. For one, having this beautiful game that we can play, IRL. Secondly, RSI created the Quantum Drive. The QD was hugely responsible, simply put, for everything. The QD of course allowed humanity to expand into the vastness of the verse, for example enabling a more swift colonisation of Mars. RSI also created the jump drive, of course further allowing the expansion into other systems such as Croshaw, this being the second solar system humanity expanded into and further colonised planets. The QD was initially up to 1% the speed of light, some 150 or so years later this increased to 10% the speed of light and now currently sits at up to 20% the speed of light. RSI is one of the oldest corporations involved in spaceship manufacturing, having been founded in 2038 by an individual called, funnily enough, Chris Roberts. I feel like I know this guy, he's not aged so well I would have thought. Not only does RSI create spacecraft of various sizes, but they also manufacture land vehicles, such as the Ursa rover and the luxury variant the Lynx. They also create various components, obviously including the quantum drives. Lastly, RSI creates spacesuits, such as the Venture and Odyssey series. RSI was of course founded in 2038, with this in mind they have since had their HQ in Manhattan, New York, but have locations in other areas such as Moscow and Jetta in the Davian system. As all ships I currently overview are concept ships, not only can you not fly them as of the upload date of this video, you also can't buy them from the pledge store whenever you wish. You can only obtain a Polaris during the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo or Invictus Week. Those being towards the end of November, coming up soon, and the end of May each year. This is typically your best means of getting a Polaris, however this isn't the only limiting factor. These sales are also limited in quantity at certain points of a day of the week in which it is being sold. All due to this being a capital ship. If you are interested in CCUs or original concept sales, then you can obtain these of course from the great market. Typically an OC will be around 900 to 1000 US dollars, the 10 year LTI variant perhaps being a little bit less. There is also a concierge game package you can obtain this from, that being the Praetorian, and of course the Legatus game packages. Will the Polaris increase in price though? I personally wouldn't expect it to increase in price, it's in a nice spot at $750 as it is, and it may increase perhaps after it's implemented, but otherwise I wouldn't expect it to increase. Don't quote me. The RSI Polaris is expected to be the biggest player obtainable ship in the game from RSI, depending on how the Bengal plays out. There is a fair grain of salt as far as how acquiring the Bengal will go, if acquiring it at all is even possible. It was said that you could find abandoned or wrecked Bengals and restore them. How true this is, I'm not so sure, with the other notable ship being the RSI Panther, of which was renamed to the RSI Pegasus later on. This is of course to be introduced into the second instalment of Squadron 42. I'm not convinced that title will release in my lifetime, however, because reasons. The reason the Polaris is, is a thing is entirely due to the size increases of the Idris. The Idris was meant to be the size of the Polaris, I believe this image represents that of when the Idris was that size. From a lore perspective however, the Polaris is designed for use as both a naval patrol ship 
and to serve as a flagship for civilian militia operations. The competitor in this regard, in my opinion, would be the Kraken, and could arguably be more superior in certain ways. Although the Polaris and Kraken are two very different ships, they do pretty much counter each other from how I see it. The Kraken with its vast amount of supporting fighters, and the Polaris with its absurdly large sized torpedoes, ultimately ending with a damage race at this point. Which one do you think will win? Uh, comment your thoughts below. The Polaris will have the ability of course to perform search and rescue operations. This will work well for a ship of this size and speed, especially for having the fighter bay and being able to load on and off the ships nicely. Not to mention it has a side ramp likely capable of housing an Ursa rover. With the fighter bay in mind, this will have the ability to do uh, moderate repairs as well as refuel and rearm facilities. Its impressive array of weapons will allow it to perform fast paced strike missions more suited to that of the Polaris, compared to the Idris's slower speed. Although the Idris may do well as backup support if the Polaris were to come under too much opposition, which is quite likely. The Polaris has a fairly unique aim of being pleasant to its crew by having enhanced morale effectiveness stuff and things and doodah stuff, such as a pool table in the mess, uh, the mess also being able to double as a recreation room. Wider corridors are also present and honestly the interior design of RSI ships generally don't look as good as the Polaris in my opinion. It's not quite to the standard of the Connie Phoenix for example, but it's not too far off. And in fairness, this may be simply due to the fact that this is one of the more recent ships as far as lore is concerned. Perhaps the newest RSI gunboat will look even better, who knows. Its overall components include one capital radar, two medium computers, two large coolers and shield generators, three large fuel intakes, two medium fuel tanks, and finally one quantum drive, jump drive, and quantum fuel tank. Having a capital radar makes this interesting. I'd assume this would be for the whole seek and destroy aspect of this ship. The Polaris does look fun as far as ganking is concerned. The part that concerns me with these components is that it only has the two medium fuel tanks, although this somewhat makes sense for a sheer speed it can achieve kind of aspect. More on this in the summary. As for thrusters, it has four main thrusters of course, along with two retro thrusters and 12 fixed maneuvering thrusters. Moving on to weapons, so what the RSI website says, what the brochure says, and what the concept images suggest, and what the initial concept Q&A said, all are slightly different. I'm more inclined to believe what the Q&A said over anything else, but again, always a grain of salt in regards to this area, and well, most areas for that matter. On the Polaris, there are five manned size 4 dual mounted turrets. These are the front two turrets here, the side turrets here, and the top rear turret. The last two turrets are either remote or automated turrets. The automated turret is this one at the front on the nose. This is a size 4 dual mounted turret, uh, much like the manned turrets already existing on the ship. The remote turret is a size 5 dual mounted turret located at the rear underneath the ship, and it appears to be rear facing looking at the brochure. This is operated by the remote turret console in the bridge. I'm not sure what I think about the side mounted turrets, it seems they're on a like a 90 degree angle. The actual gunner seat probably isn't on a 90 degree angle. I can only imagine the two minute animation of getting in and out of the seat if that was the case. Lastly, onto missiles, there are two racks of 16 size 3 missiles. These are apparently anti-fighter missiles. These will do well at fending off bombers for sure, as would the vast amount of size 4 turrets dotted around the ship. Lastly, the big guns, the four racks of 28 size 10 missiles. These are what the majority of people want this ship for. There is one concern I have about these tops, which we'll get into in the summary. Another concern, in my opinion, would be the uh, rear-facing remote turret. This would seem to be the only uh, rear defence that this ship has as far as turrets are concerned, given the unique shape of the ship. The turrets towards the front may not be angled in a way in which to be able to actually target to the rear of the ship. So it looks like there's a defensive hole, so to speak, in the Polaris at the rear. Moving on to the floor plan, 
thankfully this floor plan is likely to be relatively up to date as compared to the merchantman's floor plan. Only reason it's still up to date, of course, is due to the lack of changes actually done to the Polaris. I couldn't possibly keep track of all changes to a ship, however I found that it was apparently going to have three large shield generators rather than two, and size six tops rather than size three and ten. More on my thoughts here in the summary. The rooms on the ship are as follows, and not limited to a bridge, escape pod room, uh, there's a rear and a front escape pod room, crew quarters, a mess hall, cargo bay, fighter hangar, med bay, armory, brig, captain quarters, secondary quarters, and engineering. There are a few of these not actually present on the floor plan, or at least annotated on this floor plan. However, these other ones were confirmed in the Q&A section. These specifically include the med bay, armory, brig, captain quarters, and secondary quarters. Looking at the floor plan, these look to more easily just fit on the hallways beside the fighter bay. However, looking at the concept images and how the, the edge around the uh, hangar bay kind of slides off, I'm not sure if there would actually be enough room on the edges of the hallways by the side of the hangar. Overall, there are spaces everywhere looking at the floor plan, but it's somewhat difficult to get a sense of scale of what may or may not appear to be an empty space. From a side view, however, there are spaces underneath the hangar. Uh, to the right, I suspect the secondary quarters for the uh, second in command or the pilot, and to the left, the medical bay or perhaps the armory. The brig could be pretty small, honestly, for a ship of this size, so perhaps like four small uh, solitary cells sort of thing. And honestly, you could put this anywhere on the ship, it wouldn't really matter. So I'm not even going to try and pinpoint where this could go with that in mind. Uh, however, the engineering at the back is fairly sizable. Uh, captain quarters could fit in the right of the crew quarters, I'd expect. So this room is meant to be the torpedo loading room. They seriously weren't kidding about the wide hallways, because this is pretty wide. I mean, you, this is like an acre. That's slightly exaggerated, but it's a pretty big space. Looking at the size of this area and the fact that this is meant to be the front narrow part of the ship, I'm not so sure if the whole wide corridors idea is going to be entirely present. The mess hall looks pretty neat, however of course it's not going to rival the likes of Origin. So, to summarise the Polaris, the concept is pretty solid. It's evidently going to go through various changes that we may or may not be already aware of, or that I may have missed. I don't believe it's had a whole load of changes other than specs, such as the torpedo loadout, and the changes from the size 6s to size 3s and 10s. Also losing a large shield generator, going from 3 to 2 in total. With these changes in mind, it seemed like it was going in for literally a smaller Idris kind of approach. Then it was given a certain glass cannon approach. In my opinion, if it wasn't going to have this glass cannon approach, I don't think I'd have bought the Polaris, for the same reasons that I actually still have one. I'd expect this opinion would be mutual for a decent amount of people. As for the tops, these are going to cost an absolute bomb. No pun intended. A recent addition to the roadmap is what's called the Landing Services Update, Ordnance Replenishment. This feature is going to implement changes in pricing to everything, from hydrogen fuel to quantum fuel, to fuel, to ammo, to missiles. This will mean the size 10 tops will, again, cost a bomb. We knew this was going to eventually be implemented, and so it should, which is all well and good. Likely this will be one of the most expensive ships to run with this in mind. It could even rival the Idris, just with its torpedoes alone. And I'd expect it to rival the cost of torpedoes from the Javelin's size 12 tops. Another part of the Polaris that concerns me is the hydrogen fuel. Specifically in that it only has two medium fuel tanks. This isn't a lot. To put this into perspective, this is equal to the Redeemer and the various Vanguard fighters. However, it does have three large fuel intakes. This is one additional to that of ships such as the Carrick, the Nautilus, the 890 Jump, and especially the Hammerhead. And so the list goes on. So you'll be more susceptible to running out of fuel due to the reduced fuel tanks. However, you'll gain more over time due to the additional fuel intake. This overall will create extra challenge for the crew of a Polaris, given how it's aimed towards being nimble, fast and versatile, and therefore burning fuel. In other words, you'll want to give the Polaris a break for it to regain fuel every now and then, depending on the length or time or distance the Polaris is being deployed. I also checked, the Vulcan wouldn't fit into the fighter bay, 
I estimate a height of 7.8 meters, length of 25.8 meters, and width of 25.6 meters in the fighter bay. Assuming these floor plan images are accurate, so you'll be looking at six snub craft, best case scenario, P52 specifically. This will be a tight fit, but it probably will work. It looks like you'll fit a small fighter comfortably. You'll need to get more creative than just having these side by side if you want to have more than one small fighter in here, however. I can't imagine any more than two small fighters in here, honestly, but maybe it'll work, who knows. Continuing with components, the idea of the capital radar is interesting. Not many ships have these, only the Javelin, oddly the hull E and D have a capital radar. I'd assume this is for the whole seek and destroy aspect of the Polaris, given that the Polaris has one. Additionally, the capital power plant is interesting, opening up the upgrade possibilities for sure. That will be all for the RSI Polaris. So to conclude, I would have a Polaris in a heartbeat. Fully enough, that heartbeat happened quite some months ago. I'm glad I forked out for it, it's got a decent balance of speed, weaponry, versatility and crew requirements. I've been interested in an Idris before, however I never forked out for it knowing that I'd not be able to crew it easily enough, whether that be AI crew or IRL crew. The Polaris on the other hand will do well enough with maybe several crew members, obviously a pilot, and a bunch of people in turrets, much like how a hammerhead would go. If the pilot doesn't control the torps then maybe a co-pilot or remote gunner. Whoever would be responsible for the torps would obviously need a seat in my crew. The rest could be handled with AI crew, however not much AI crew would be required to fulfil the rest of the Polaris from here, unlike the Idris. This video was quite some work to produce and took a lot of time and so this is why this is considerably later than I'd like it to have been. I've quickly approached the monetization watch hours and this video will likely take me past the 4000 watch hours required. As of this video upload, it will have taken a grand total of 90 days from zero to where I am now. I want to thank you all for the incredible journey that you've put me on. It's been stressful and occasionally overwhelming, but overall enjoyable. Next upcoming videos will include a MSR first look, given that that was released earlier, Nautilus overview, Corsair overview, and Starliner overview, just to name a few. The cage for my camera arrived the other week, this is how that looks. Still a few other bits to come for proper face involving videos to be where I'd like them to be, and well, for now I'm going to leave the rest of that as my own little secret. Thank you ever so much for watching. Today's video sponsor is the like button for the glorious YouTube algorithm. That will of course allow this channel to grow with your support. Obviously don't forget to comment or subscribe if you haven't already. If you aren't aware, I generally upload once or twice a week, so be sure to check back. My name is Jacob. Thank you and goodbye for now.